Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into this very interesting and terrifying second half, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? I'm sitting on a white plastic chair in what seems like total darkness. Strapped to my chest and shoulders is an array of electronic gear, microphones, a video camera, a box that detects magnetic changes, and a Geiger counter. Somewhere in the mix is a flashlight, the only device whose function I understand, and thus the only device I cannot find. In front of me I can almost make out the sinister shapes of some truly spooky trees. The violent bugs are buzzing in and out of my eyes and ears, and it occurs to me that there must be a tavern open somewhere nearby, even in this remote corner of Utah. One hundred or more yards away, beyond a barbed wire fence and a little creek, are my fellow paranormal rangers, equipped with their own video cameras, night vision goggles, and assorted scientific gear. They're supposed to be watching me to see if anything happens. On this night I am the bait, bait for what I wonder. The unspoken hope is my own inherent weirdness might give me some sort of connection to the undeniably odd energy or entity that seems to have concentrated itself on this remote rural community and in particular on this small ranch where I now sit waiting for something to announce its presence. Some very strange things have happened at this precise spot where I am sitting. It is here that a visitor was accosted by a roaring but nearly invisible creature, something akin to the predator of the movie Fame. It is here that a Ph.D. physicist reported that his mind was invaded, literally taken over by some sort of hostile intelligence that warned him that he was not welcome. It is here that the entire team of researchers watched in awe as a bright door or portal opened up in the darkness and a large humanoid creature crawled out before quickly vanishing. And it is here that several animals, cattle and dogs, were mutilated, obliterated or simply disappeared. For as long as anyone can remember, this part of northeastern Utah has been the site of simply unbelievable paranormal activity. UFOs, Sasquatch, cattle mutilations, psychic manifestations. Creatures that are not found in any zoos or textbooks, poltergeist events, you name it, residents have seen it. Retired school teacher Junior Hicks is the area's unofficial historian for all things weird. He's cataloged 400 or so incidents, most of them involving UFO sightings but says there have been thousands of other cases. Hicks estimates at least half of the 50,000 residents of this basin have seen weird things in the sky. Flying saucers, cigar-shaped craft, zigzagging balls of light, so many different objects that local police and highway patrol long ago stopped taking reports. Many of the lawmen have been witnesses themselves. 
Hicks and members of his family have witnessed their own UFO events over the years. The UFO activity really started getting intense in the early 50s, Hicks states. There were cases where a whole school and all the teachers saw these things hovering over the town in broad daylight. In the 60s and 70s, we probably had more UFO sightings than any place in the world. But the run-of-the-mill UFO events don't begin to describe the rich array of unusual phenomena in the area. The U Indian tribe has been here far longer than white settlers. Tribal leaders are reluctant to speak to outsiders, but their oral history is repelt with examples of strange creatures and sightings. Indian lore refers to some of these creatures as skinwalkers, other call them shapeshifters, werewolves, or Bigfoot. The Utes take this very seriously, Hicks states. They think the skinwalker are powerful spirits that are here because of a curse that was put on them generations ago by the Navajo. And the center of the whole legend is this ranch. The Utes say the ranch is the path of the skinwalker. Tribe members are strictly forbidden from setting foot on the property. It's been that way for a long time. The ranch in question is a 480-acre spread of rich, well-watered pasture and a few thick patches of tall cottonwood. It's divided into three sections, each section being a former homestead. Thick brush and small river are on one side, a rocky, picturesque ridge is on the other. Skinwalker Ranch is what the Utes call it, according to Hicks. A long dirt road is the only way in or out of this ranch. When rancher Tom Gorman, not his real name, bought the place in 1994, it had been vacant for seven or eight years. Gorman and his wife and two kids were curious about the impressive array of bolts that covered the doors and windows of the main home. There were dead bolts on both sides of the doors. Even the kitchen cabinets had both bolts on them. And at both ends of the home, iron stakes and heavy chains had been installed. Gorman guessed the previous tenants had positioned large guard dogs in the front and back of the house. But he had no idea why. On the day the Gormans moved their furnishings into the property, they had their first foreshadowing events that would follow. They spotted an extremely large wolf out in the pasture. The wolf cautiously made its way across the field, and to the surprise of everyone, so lit up to the family, acting like it was a familiar pet. It had rained that day, and the family remembers the wolf smelled like wet dog as they were petting it. After a few moments, the wolf strolled over to the corral and grabbed a calf by its snout, attempting to pull it through the corral bars. Gorman and his father began to beat on the wolf with sticks, but it would not release the calf. Gorman grabbed his 357 Magnum from his truck and shot the wolf at point-blank range. The slug had no noticeable effect. Gorman pumped another bullet into the wolf, which then let go of the calf but stood looking at the family as if nothing had happened. Gorman shot it two more times with this powerful handgun. The big animal backed off a bit but showed no signs of distress. Not even any blood. The mystified rancher retrieved a hunting rifle and shot the wolf again, once more at close range. Gorman is not only an experienced marksman, but a big game hunter of considerable repute. Five slugs should have been enough to bring down an elk, let alone a wolf. The fifth shot caused a chunk of hair and flesh to fly off the wolf, but it did not seem faced. After the sixth shot, the wolf casually trotted across the field into the muddy thicket. Gorman and his father tracked the beast for about a mile, following its paw prints through the mud, but the track suddenly ended, as if the wolf had simply vanished into thin air. Returning to the corralled area, Gorman examined the chunk of flesh and said it looked and smelled like rotten meat. He made inquiries among the neighbors, but no one seemed to know anything about a tamed, oversized wolf in the area. A few weeks later, Mrs. Gorman 
encountered a wolf that was so large its back was parallel with the top of her window as it stood beside her car. The wolf was accompanied by a dog-like animal that she could not identify. Over the next two years, a menagerie of weird animals was reported by the family members and neighbors while driving into the ranch on a bright afternoon. Gorman and his wife saw something attacking one of the horses. They described it as low to the ground, heavy muscled, weighing perhaps 200 pounds, with curly red hair and a bushy tail. It somewhat resembled a muscular hyena and seemed to be clawing at the horse, almost playing with it. Gorman got within 40 feet of the animal, but says it literally vanished before his eyes. Poof! Gone. They checked the horse and found numerous claw marks on its legs. A few months later, the wife of the deputy sheriff reporting seeing a similar muscular reddish beast running across the property. Another visitor to the ranch had a more ominous encounter in the middle of the homestead. The same place where I was set as bait. The visitor, along with Gorman and his son, say they saw a large, blurry something moving through the trees. The visitor had been meditating when this thing showed up. It swiftly moved from the trees across the pasture, covering a hundred yards in seconds. And when it reached the man, it let out a ferocious roar, something akin to a large bear, a roar loud enough to be heard hundreds of yards away. But this was no bear. It was, according to the Gormans, nearly invisible, resembling the camouflaged being in the movie The Predator. The visitor was so scared he grabbed onto Gorman and would not let go. He left the ranch and has never returned. Other creatures and beings were also seen, including exotic multicolored birds that were certainly not native to the region and could not be identified. There were numerous close encounters with dark, nine-foot-tall beasts that resembled Bigfoot or Sasquatch. As if those visual experiences were not enough, the family claims its other senses were also challenged by assorted weird events. They often were overwhelmed by a strong musk odor. The pastures would unexplainably light up at night like a football stadium, they claim to have seen shafts of light that seemingly emanated from the ground. They and others say they heard what sounded like heavy machinery operating under the earth, and they heard voices. Tom and his son and his nephew remember hearing a loud, disembodied conversation in some unintelligible language. The disembodied male voices spoke in what the witness say was a mocking tone and sounded like they were emanating from 20 or more feet above their heads. But they saw nothing. The dogs accompanying these three witnesses growled and barked at the voices, then took off in a panic. There were physical manifestations that aren't easily explained. While checking on his herd in the third homestead, Gorman noticed that someone had dug up his pasture. Hundreds of pounds of soil had been scooped out of the ground. The edges of the hole resembled perfect cylindrical circles, as if someone had dropped a gigantic cookie cutter on the pasture. Several smaller scoop marks were also found. The Gormans also reported phenomena similar to crop circles. One formation found in their pasture consisted of three circles of flattened grass. Each circle was approximately 8 feet in diameter, and they were arranged in a triangle pattern, with each circle about 30 feet from the others. Now keep in mind, there is only one road leading into the ranch. Anyone coming or going would almost certainly have been noticed by the Gormans or by the neighbors. In the spring of 95, the Gormans started seeing strange things in the sky. While well, checking on their cattle, Gorman and his nephew spotted what they thought was a recreational vehicle parked on the property. They approached it, figuring the driver might have had mechanical problems. As they got closer, the RV moved silently away from them. They moved closer, it moved further away. 
They climbed a fence to get a better look at it, and that's when they knew this was no Winnebago. The craft rose above the treetops and slowly flew away, making no sound as it departed. It certainly was no helicopter. The witness had a clear view and says the object was shaped like a refrigerator, with a single light on its front and a red light on the back. Before long, everyone in the family was seeing weird aerial objects. Mrs. Gorman says something that resembled a stealth fighter, but ringed with blinking disco lights, silently hovered above 20 feet over her vehicle, zipping off. Each member had repeated sightings of a cloud that usually hovered just outside of the property. The cloud was characterized as having blinking Christmas tree lights or silent mini-explosions inside. Among the other aerial craft seen by the Gormans, their neighbors and other witnesses were classic flying saucer objects. Flying sombrero shafts of light similar to fluorescent light tubes and a cigar-shaped craft several football fields long. By far the most common objects they witnessed were floating spheres of different sizes and colors. In 95 and 96, the Gormans and others reported 12 separate incidents of seeing large orange circles flying above the trees at the center of their homestead. Tom Gorman claims that holes occasionally opened up in the orange spheres, and other smaller spheres would fly out. A neighboring rancher told this report of his own encounters with what he called flying orange basketball. By early 96, the sightings of blue spheres at the ranch became almost commonplace. These orbs were said to be about the size of a softball made of glass and filled with bubbling blue liquids that seemed to rotate inside. Mr. and Mrs. Gorman say that in April of 96, they watched one of those blue orbs repeatedly circle the head of one of their horses. The horse was illuminated by an intense blue light, and there was a sound of static electricity in the air. But this was not a ball lightning. The orb seemed to be intelligently controlled. When Gorman approached the horse with a flashlight, the orb darted off, maneuvering through the tree branches with speed and dexterity. Mormons say the blue spears seemed to generate several psychological effects on the family. Family members felt waves of fear roll over them, far in excess of what may be normal. Whatever the blue orbs appeared, it was the appearance of one blue orb in particular that finally convinced the Gormans to sell the ranch. One evening in May of 96, Gorman was outside with three of his dogs when he noticed a blue orb darting around in the field near the home. Gorman urged his dogs to go after the ball. The dogs chased and snapped at the orb, but it dodged and maneuvered enough to just stay out of reach of their snapping jaws. The ball led the dogs out across the pasture and into the thick brush that borders the field. Gorman says he heard the dogs make three terrible yelps. Then they were silent. He called for them, but they did not respond. The next morning, Gorman went to look for his dogs. What he found were three round spots of dried and brittle vegetation. In the middle of each circle was a black, greasy lump. Gorman surmised that his dogs had been incinerated by something. One thing for sure, the dogs were. Never seen again, the disappearance of their dogs prompted the Gormans to think about getting out. Tom Gorman wasn't some country bumpkin farmer trying to get by. He had a college degree and advanced training in animal husbandry, was considered an expert in artificial insemination, and had plans for raising hybrid high-end stock at Picturesque Ranch. His herd, which ranged from 60 to 80 head, consisted of expensive top-of-the-line heifers and four 2,000-pound show-class bulls. From the day he moved his herd onto the ranch, though his hopes and his animals seemed to be under assault, the balls of light that were seen so often on the property seemed to take special interest in the cattle. 
and were often seen buzzing around their heads. Sometimes the cattle would react violently, the herd splitting suddenly as if some invisible force was plowing through their middle. It soon got worse. Though the Gormans kept a close watch on their stock, something began exacting a terrible toll. One cow was found dead in the field. A strange, crisp hole had been cut into the eye. There were no tracks or blood, and Gorman wondered what could have done such a thing. He noticed a strong musk odor around the carcass, a smell he would come to know all too well. Cattle mutilations had been reported throughout North America for several decades. In typical cases, the ears, eyes, udders, and sex organs have been removed with surgical precision. Gorman's animals were subjected to all of the above. As an experienced hunter and rancher, Gorman was more than familiar with the capabilities of natural predators. This was not being done by coyotes or mountain lions. The butchery was simply too clean and no blood was ever left at the scene of the attacks. His other animals also suffered. His favorite horse had its legs slashed, as if a sharp instrument or claw. The musk odor was still in the air when he discovered the damaged horse. His dogs seemed to develop paranoia. They stayed inside their doghouse for days at a time, too fearful to emerge even for food. Six of the family's cats vanished in one night. Soon, cattle started disappearing altogether. One of the animals vanished from a snow-covered field. Gorman saw hoof prints lead into the field, but the track simply stopped as if the animal had been plucked from the sky. A 1,200-pound cow leaves tracks in the snow, Gorman said to himself. So, what happened to this one? In all, 14 of Gorman's prized animals were either sliced up or vanished. In one instance... A cow was found mutilated just five minutes after Gorman's son had checked on it. Something cut a hole six inches wide, 18 inches deep, in the animal's rectum. A cord-out section extended into the cow's body cavity, yet there was no blood on the cow or on the snow-covered ground. The loss of 14 expensive animals from an 80-head herd is extreme by any standards. There were other losses as well but from explainable causes. It meant that Gorman was close to financial collapse. One April afternoon, Gorman and his wife took a quick drive to town for supplies. As they passed the corral that contained their four bulls, they commented to each other that they'd be really in trouble if something were to happen to one of those bulls. When they returned to the ranch less than an hour later, all four bulls were gone. The Gormans began a frantic search for the missing behemoths, but couldn't find a trace. As a last resort, Gorman decided to peek in a metal trailer that was situated inside the corral. He thought highly unlikely that the bulls would be inside. From the corral, there is only one door into the trailer, and it's secured by a thick metal wire wire that clearly was still in place. Gorman was shocked to see that all four of his bulls were inside the trailer, squeezed like so many oversized sardines into a tiny enclosure, crammed in against the sides of the trailer and against each other. When he yelled to his wife that he'd found them, the bulls seemingly woke up as if in a dream state and started kicking the hell out of the trailer and each other. There is simply no way that anyone could coax these four bulls into a trailer, says Comb Kelleher, a microbiologist who would come to know Gorman well. It would be tough enough to get one of them into the trailer, but all four virtually impossible. The only door leading from the corral into the trailer was still secured by fastened wire. And there were cobwebs on the inside of the door, proving that it had not been opened. It's almost as if someone overheard the ranchers worrying about their bull, then decided to mess with them. Kelleher didn't realize it back in 96, but the Gorman Ranch was soon to become his home away from home. Kelleher is the deputy administrator of NIDS, 
the National Institute for Discovery Science, a Las Vegas-based research organization founded by a local businessman, Robert Bigelow. Bigelow's long-standing interests in the paranormal topics, including UFO, animal mutilations, and human consciousness, prompted him to assemble an impressive team of engineers, psychologists, physicists, and other decorate-level professionals for the purpose of investigating subjects that are largely shunned by mainstream science. By the mid-96, the Gormans were ready to cash in their chips. Those who knew Tom Gorman says he blamed himself for the weird string of events that had ruined his ranching operation. He didn't want to give up, but felt cursed and was ready to bail for the sake of his family. In an uncharacteristic moment, he told the parts of this story to a news reporter. A respected journalist from Salt Lake City heard about it, came to the ranch and talked to the family. Pictures were taken, and wire service picked up the story. That's how Bob Bigelow learned about the Skinwalker Ranch. Bigelow and his team flew to Utah and introduced themselves to the Gormans. Nid staffers checked out the story, interviewed the neighbors, and evaluated Gorman's seemingly incredible tales. Bigelow offered to buy the ranch outright with the idea of transforming it into an interactive paranormal laboratory, an ongoing experiment that might shed some light on questions that have been viewed with a scientific skepticism. Amazingly, he talked the Gormans into staying at the ranch as caretakers. By this point, the family is a wreck. The UFOs, balls of light, cattle mutilations, animal disappearances, Bigfoot sightings, and skinwalker legends are bad enough, but there had also been an ongoing series of more personal events. Things had occurred within their home that had made a normal life impossible. They saw apparitions in the house, blinding lights, dark creatures peering into the windows, furnishing tools and everyday items moved around, disappeared, or turned up in unusual places. No one could sleep. When they did manage to grab a few hours, they were plagued by violent nightmares, often describing later different family members had experienced identical dreams. The two kids, honor roll students, before arriving at the ranch, saw their grades plummet. Mrs. Gorman lost her job at the local bank because of repeated absences and disturbing water cooler tales. Hoping for safety in numbers, the Gormans slept each night on the floor of their front room. The folks at NIDS offered moral, emotional, and financial support to the Gormans. What's more, they had a plan. The ranch presented what appeared to be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to legitimately study a full menu of paranormal activities. They endeavored to seal off the ranch, pack it with high-tech modern equipment, staff it around the clock with trained observers to see what happens. Some residents sarcastically wondered what the hucksters from Las Vegas really had in mind. A scam of some sorts was one off-mentioned possibility. UFO buffs whined that Bob Bigelow was a shadowy guy who may or may not have CIA connections and that he was out to somehow corner the market on E.T. They demanded that whatever happened at the ranch should be made immediately available for their evaluation. Paranormal debunkers predicted the NIDS team would come up empty-handed because unexplained events inevitably wither under careful scrutiny. As it turns out, all three of these groups were wrong. NIDS did seal off the ranch from the outside observers, but not for any monetary gain. Neither the CIA nor any other government agency had any input or access to these things that had occurred in, under NIDS' watch. And a phenomenon itself did not wither or evaporate. For the past six years, events at the ranch have been under constant scrutiny. Witnesses, including highly accomplished scientists and law and order personnel, have documented 
a mind-boggling array of unusual activity. But there has been a near-total blackout on the release of any information about the site. By agreement with Bigelow, a reporter was granted the first outside access to the ranch and to scientists and ex-lawmen who have been studying it. Interviews were conducted with the ranch, as well as with the community and the memories who had reported unusual events, and several nights were spent out on the ranch itself, watching for odd lights and other manifestations. No one who has studied this can say with any certain what's going on. The NIDS researchers are not making any claims about ETs, ghosts, skinwalkers. They are merely collecting data and trying to make some sort of sense out of it. That is a small comfort to me as I sit in darkness on my plastic little chair waiting for something to happen. The mind certainly can play tricks in such an environment, but... Could so many witnesses be completely wrong? Do not travel to the ranch. You are not welcome there. It is private property and the people who live on or near don't want to be hassled by curiosity seekers or the media. What's more, a high level of unexplained phenomena has taken a steady nosedive over the past few months. So chances are you wouldn't see anything, even if you could, on this property. This next part is an add-on. As if to punctuate the point, the phenomenon at the ranch seemed to constantly evolve. One of the most recent incidents occurred on a cold morning in February. The caretaker for the property was patrolling the grounds early in the morning. As he walked past a watering hole, he noticed an odd circular impression in the thin ice that had formed overnight. Something had carved a perfect circle into the ice. The circle was just under six feet in diameter and seemed oddly reminiscent of the crop formation seen in England's wheat field. The cuts extended only a quarter of an inch into the ice and the ice itself is another quarter of an inch. The question arises, how could this have been done? Someone standing on that muddy bank would, would have left footprints. The only footprint are cattle tracks. The ice itself is so thin that it could not support almost no weight and certainly would have cracked if broken. Of all the strange incidents at the ranch, this one takes the prize. It occurred on the night of March 12, 1997. Barking dogs alerted the team to something lurking in a tree near the ranch house. Tom Gorman grabbed his hunting rifle and took off in his truck toward the tree. Two Nid staffers followed the other vehicle. All the strange incidents at the ranch, this one takes the cake. It occurred in the night of March 12, 1997. Barking dogs alerted the team to something lurking in the tree near the ranch house. Gorman grabbed his hunting rifle, took off in his truck toward the tree. Two Nid staffers followed in another vehicle. Up in the tree branches, they could make out a huge set of yellowish reptilian eyes. The head of this creature had to be three feet wide, they guessed. At the bottom of the tree was something else. Gorman describes it as huge, hairy, with a massively muscled front legs and a dog-like head. Gorman, who's a crack shot, fired at both figures from a distance of 40 yards. The creature on the ground seemed to vanish. The thing in the tree apparently fell to the ground because Gorman heard it land heavily in a patch of snow. All three men ran through the pasture and scrub chasing what they thought was a wounded animal, but they never found an animal or saw any blood. A professional tracker was brought in the next day to scour the area, and nothing. There was a physical clue left behind. 
At the bottom of the tree, they found and photographed a weird footprint, or rather a claw print. The print left in the snow was something large. It had three digits with what they guessed sharp claws at the end. Later analysis and comparison of the print led them to find chilling similarity. The print from the ranch closely resembled that of a velociraptor, an extinct dinosaur made famous from the Jurassic Park movies. For the record, no one at NIDS is saying they shot a velociraptor. They don't know what it was. All right, folks, that was tonight's second half. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps this channel growing and going and what gives people a place to share their experiences, ideas, and theories, judgment and ridicule-free, just treated with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real, they are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.